I have some bad news for all of you. Maybe you should sit down for this. You are? <laughs> Unless I really get carried away, this will be our last message in the book of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> I, was, I was waiting for that. You know, 22 messages ago when we first started this track, we were, uh, we, we found ourselves at the beginning of a pandemic and found ourselves in a very isolated place, in a very lonely place, and, and many of us had questions that started out with, why? What in the world is going on? Why did this have to happen? How come it had to happen to me? We've all heard that. Why have my loved ones gone through what they have gone through? I heard people say, why do we have to be locked up in our homes for so long? Why are the hospitals overwhelmed? Why do I have loved ones that are there? Why do I have loved ones that would never come home? We heard a lot of questions. And back at the beginning of the year, as all of these questions were being asked, we were looking to find answers, and we were looking in a variety of places. And while I am not a scientist, I never profess to be, while I am not a politician, of which I never hope to be, I will say this, that there are so many people and organizations that will tell you they have the answer. I want to share with you, I do not have the answer for this pandemic, but I do have the answer to how we are to respond in the face of this pandemic. You heard me use the phrase as we pray the great song grace. And this has been a year like no other. And I am thankful that while we do not have the wherewithal, at least I don't think we do, uh, here within this room, to conquer this virus, God's Word does tell us how to live. And God's Word does encourage us with these words, uh, been there, done that. And God's Word does say, you know what, uh, yeah, times are tough, uh, but God rises above the toughness of the world to where we find ourselves today. Okay. Uh, in a roundabout way, that is, that is a, a great description of, of this statement, uh, we serve a sovereign God. Back in the time of the preacher, they weren't dealing with COVID, but they were dealing with a variety of other things, and really at, at its base or the questions that were being asked then, the same questions that we ask today, and they were questions that revolved around life. How do we look at life? How do we live life? How is it that we can experience joy in the life that we have? The preacher started off, man, he tried everything, didn't he? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say it this way, uh, he tried the wine, women, and song, uh, and that is a description of, of everything that he tried. He tried wisdom, he tried knowledge, he tried this and that. The very first message that we gave out of the book of Ecclesiastes, I used this illustration, and I want to... Uh, started this message with exactly the same illustration. Uh, it's a quote from the book 
entitled Blue Like Jazz. I love jazz. But Donald Miller wrote this. I never liked jazz music because the jazz music does not resolve. He writes, but I was outside the Baghdad Theater in Portland one night when I saw a man playing the saxophone. I stood there for 15 minutes and he never once opened his eyes. After that, I liked jazz music. Sometimes you must watch somebody love something before you can love it yourself. It is as if they are showing you the way. He goes on to write this. I used to not like a God because God does not resolve. But that was before any of this happened. As he discovered, he lived in a world that wasn't altogether different from what the preacher lived in. Uh, this is a, a great way of saying the more things change, uh, the more they stay the same. And so while the preacher wasn't dealing with COVID, he was dealing with questions of life and how to live it. And that is where not just us as the church, but our culture around us, uh, that is what they are screaming for, though they will not put it in those terms. They are looking for significance. They are looking for meaning. And so as we end in Ecclesiastes, I'd like to direct your attention. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 9. We're going to take it through the end of the book. It says this, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, reigning and studying and arranging many of Proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goats and like nails fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Don't you wish we could have gone from Ecclesiastes chapter 1 in week 1 and gone to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 on verse 2 and we had known everything that the preacher knew? That would have been okay for some of you, right? Okay. Uh, some of you are going like this, and I get it. But there have been a lot of lessons that we have learned out of the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, what has been written here in this book is not the rantings of a madman. While seemingly some of the things that don't make sense, hopefully, prayerfully, we have seen how God has used the book of Ecclesiastes and everything just kind of comes together and gels in a way that maybe we have not seen before. One of the principles, the overall theme is this. We are to be grateful for God's gifts to us and to enjoy them while we are here on earth. I think that's important. I think it's important to recognize that we worship the giver of the gifts. Amen? Uh, we don't worship the gift. We're thankful for the gift and we exercise the gifts that he gives to us but we worship the giver of the gift. I love the fact that the preacher took the time to write things down. Because we have a record of everything that he has tried. When I go to the grocery store, Karen will send me in for cake mix. I'll use that as an example. She'll say yellow cake mix. Okay, so guys, if you're like me, You'll go into the store, and you know your wife said yellow cake mix, and you'll look at the cake mixes, and there are 10 different brands of yellow cake mix. 
So Karen will be out in the car, and I will actually send her a picture. Is this the one you want? I've had so many people laugh at me in the store. I had one lady say, they're all the same. I said, oh, not to my bride. And so she will say yes or no, or this or that, or sometimes she'll say, yeah, that's okay. When she says that's okay, I know that's not okay. She needs something else. I am glad that when I go into the store, she can write things down, and I have a record of what I need to get. The preacher wrote things down. He gave us a detailed list of what he tried and his thought processes behind it. And I'm thankful that he did that because there's a very important reason that we're going to see here in the last part of Ecclesiastes uh, why the book of Ecclesiastes is such an important book in God's Word. And can I say, uh, all of the 66 books that we have in God's Word are important. Okay? There is a reason why they are there. Um, I, I joke with Harold sometimes. We would be out having lunch and I would say, you know what, Harold, have you ever preached a series on the Leviticus? How many of y'all have read through the book of Leviticus? You think Ecclesiastes is tough. You know what Harold said? Harold looked at me and said, uh, no, I don't think I've ever done that. Yeah, Harold's going like this. Uh, I have not either, but yet there is a reason why the book of Leviticus is part of of God's Word. As we look into Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12, I cannot help but think of the similarities that we find here in these last few verses of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Uh, there is a similarity that we find between uh, the words of Jesus at the close of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and 20 uh, commonly called the Great Commission. Go therefore, make disciples. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, what a great promise this is, I am with you always to the end of the age. The somewhat surprising answer to some of my questions is this. Just like Jesus in the book of Matthew, the preacher seems to have a great interest in bringing people to God and in showing people what God is like. And so while he wrote this book, and remember, he wrote it from the perspective of where he finds himself, boots on the ground, even in everything that he has tried and the conclusions that he comes up with, comes up with, it is all about pointing people to the God that he knows. There is a reason for living. There is a purpose to what goes on around us. And the preacher, seeks to share those things with us. You've heard me say before that one of the other reasons that we have for the book of Ecclesiastes being in uh, Scripture is this. Uh, all Scripture is profitable, right? For teaching, for reproving, for correction, for instruction. I don't know about y'all, uh, there have been some weeks I've had to lift my feet up and because it would be pretty easy to get the phone stopped on. Because there is a lot that is here. And so, when we look at that, it's not surprising that you would see some similarities between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, Jesus giving us the mandate to make disciples. And then we have the preacher on the other side of the cross who doesn't have the benefit that you and I have of looking back to the cross, but yet pointing people to the glory of God. And so when we look at the disciple-making process that we see here in Ecclesiastes, and we see how it revolves around the words of Christ that we find in Matthew, 
We see five defined steps, and I want to share those with you here this morning. Five defined steps for making disciples. The first one is this, inspiration. Inspiration. In verses 10 and 11 of Ecclesiastes 12, the preacher sought to find words of delight. And uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails are fixed or collected sayings. These are given by one shepherd. So we'll come back to the first part of verse 11 here in a moment. Uh, there are two things I want us to focus on here for just a moment. Uh, the first one is this. Uh, we need to notice the source of the preacher's words. Words are important, right? Whether you write them down or you speak them, words are important. We notice the source of the preacher's words, although he is the one who has written all of these things down so that they could be preserved for us. He recognizes that these words were given by who? One shepherd. They were given by one shepherd. That is a title that is frequently used in the Old Testament for God himself. Although he may have been the one to write the words down, he recognized that God was the author and the preacher was the one who wrote it down. That is an important concept for us to know. We see that in the New Testament as well. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says this, No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we already made mention of this. All scripture is given by inspiration. In the Greek, that literally means it is breathed out by God. And then it is profitable for these things. Although the words we have studied may have been penned by the preacher, they are God's words, and that's why we have them today. Uh, the second thing we notice here is the words that the preacher has written down are words of truth. Words of truth. That fact is very closely related to the first. Truth is important, isn't it? Yes? yes? Truth is important. We see that God's word is true. John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth that your word is truth. The sum total of everything that is true is found in the very word of God. And the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes is saying this. You know what? Yeah. These words are true. They are true. And it, there are a lot of good and helpful materials out there to help you study. I'm thankful for that. Uh, Harold, he was a pastor for a lot of years. Harold had a library and a half. How do I know that? He was kind enough to give me some of his library. I'm thankful for that. Scott has a lot of Bible study resources at his disposal. And you know what? Those are great resources. I have resources at my disposal that I do. And while these resources are great, we find the commands of God, and not in those resources, but in the very words of God. His word is true. His word is true. We must ultimately use God's word as the foundation for everything that we do. Okay? Uh, I will speak for Harold and Scott because uh, uh, I have been where they are. Uh, we probably... Uh, I know I do anyway. We have our go-to authors, don't we? Uh, 
Uh, if you see this author write a cookbook, it might not have anything to do with theology, but pick it up because you'll probably find something in there about theology. I mean, anything they write is gold, and you just must have it. And while that is important when we teach and when we preach and when we live, uh, you know what? Uh, we use the Word of God as the foundation for what we do. Inspiration. Secondly, and this goes hand in hand with inspiration, there has to be perspiration. Perspiration. In verse 9 it says this, Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. You know, it looks like when we read the book of Ecclesiastes, and I will confess to you, there were sometimes I read chapters and I went, where in the world did that come from? Am I the only one that did that? And how does this go with this? And there are times where it took a lot of digging, and then all of a sudden it's kind of like that light bulb, like in the cartoons, that light bulb went off. Oh, there it is. The book of Ecclesiastes often appears that way, but we find that the preacher wrote the book, uh, and it is a result of a diligent, systematic approach. Okay. There was a method to his madness. You know what? The disciple-making process requires hard work from you and from me. It will not just happen by osmosis or chance. Have you ever tried the osmosis theory of study? Okay, where you're reading something and you put it under your pillow at night when you go to sleep and you just hope and pray it sinks in while you're sleeping? Study doesn't work that way. I guess these days, Scott, we would fall asleep at our computers. It doesn't work that way. It takes a lot of hard work. It requires that we diligently study the scriptures. In fact, Paul describes one who studies as a workman, somebody who works to study and to research. 2 Timothy 2, 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Notice it doesn't say a slacker, but it says a worker who has no need to be ashamed. Why? Because he is rightly dividing, rightly handling the word of truth. Can I say that's why as pastors, uh, we need to take doctrine seriously. As Sabbath school teachers, we need to take theology seriously. And you might be sitting there this morning going, I'm not even one of them, I'm good. We all need to take it seriously. We are workers who handle rightly the words of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 is another exhortation, but as for you, Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Timothy began his journey with the scriptures very early, in his life, and Paul urges him not to stop, but rather, as you see there, continue in what you have learned. One of the greatest joys of studying God's Word is there is always something there to be found. Always. You can read through a passage ten times. And boy, that 11th time, you might find something you didn't see the other 10 times. We did a series here several years ago on the 23rd Psalm. We broke that down. We did a, a verse a week, so it was a six-week series. There were some things in there as I was studying and researching that 
I never even thought about it. Now what? There is always something new and rich for us to discover as we open the text. And so for those that would say, I just don't know what to do with this. Or they will say, you know, I, I have read through the Bible. What else do I need to do? <laughs> Read it again. When you're done with that, read it again. Keep going. There is something that is always there for us to discover. Uh, there is certainly much evidence that Jesus' disciples were diligent in their studies as well, and that they knew the scriptures. That is why Peter, for instance, could get up on the day of Pentecost and, boy, what a powerful message. He preached. You know, it was a short message, but it was packed with a lot of theology. And talk about living theology right where you are. I mean, they did that. But it's quite obvious that Peter was quite uh, the student. Remember Philip, uh, Philip explaining the scriptures to the Ethiopian official on, on the road. These were people who studied. These were people who spent time pouring over the texts that they knew. You know what else I love about them? <laughs> Boy, they were right there with Jesus himself. Wow! That's the best book you're ever going to see. And here you have the disciples that are sharing that with others. When it comes to knowing the Bible, there is no substitute for thorough study of God's Word. And you might say, well, boy, that's why we come to church. And I say, I'm glad you all are here. But don't just do your studying here. Read, study, meditate, pray wherever you find yourself. Thirdly, transmission. Transmission. Chapter 12, verse 9, besides being wise, the preacher taught the people knowledge, weighing, studying, and arranging many proverbs with great care. All the time that the preacher spent with God's word was not just for his benefit. It was so that he could pass it along to others. I, for one, am very thankful for the book of Ecclesiastes in the year 2020. The subtitle of the series was When Life Doesn't Make Sense. For this year, for how many of you think 2020 makes any kind of sense at all? So if ever there was a book uh, to read and ponder, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes certainly it. We discovered in the very first week of our study uh, that the preacher's name literally means assembler, one who would bring people together and would teach them based on what he had learned through diligent study. Notice the preacher didn't keep it for himself, but rather he shared that. He shared all of that. And that is what the book of Ecclesiastes is. And you know, Jesus commanded us to do exactly the same thing, didn't he? In Matthew 28, 20, he starts out like this, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This isn't a command just for pastors. So we should be doing that, right? Okay, this is where you all go like this. Pastors should do that, yes? Okay. Y'all aren't doing it because you know where I'm going with this, don't you? Okay. What about Sabbath school teachers? Should they be doing this? Okay. What about our deacons? I'm thankful for our deacons. Should they be doing this? How about y'all? Should you be doing this? All of a sudden, I'm getting this. 
What he's saying is this, make sure that you are studying and make sure that you are applying the right things. Remember earlier I said it's important that we use the text of scripture as our foundation of living. Okay. I also would like to equate it this way. To study just for academics is not the same thing as studying for application. Not the same thing. We need to make sure that we are studying for the right reason and that within our application we are using scripture as our foundation. The primary point here is that we are not just to study for the purpose of getting more information, but rather that we would apply that which we have learned. And the reason that we focus on the application of God's word is that every person, everyone is going to give an account uh, to God for how we apply God's word in our lives. At the end of verse 13, we see this, it's a very curious phrase, for this is man's all. In other words, every person, you, me, everyone, is responsible to apply God's word in his or her life by fearing God and keeping his commandments. In verse 14, we find out why that application is so necessary, why it is so crucial because one day every person, whether that person is a Christ follower or not, will be judged by God based on whether they have feared God and kept his commandments. There will be a judgment that comes. The judgment is described as this in Hebrews chapter 10. This would be the judgment for those who neglect so great a salvation. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That is judgment that will come for those who do not know Christ. You might say, good, that's not me. I've accepted Christ. To that I'm going to say, praise God. But there is still a judgment for us in how we apply God's word. Second Corinthians 5.10 We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, uh, whether good or evil. The judgment is not for the purpose of determining our salvation, but it is the purpose of determining our rewards based on how we have applied and obeyed the commands and the principles of God's word. You know what? If we are born again children of God, keeping his commandments should be at the forefront of everything that we do. John chapter 15, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So the bottom line is this, uh, the true test of whether we love God is not what we say, but rather it's found in what we do. If we apply His commands to our lives, we will prove that we love God. If we do not love God, we will not follow His Commandments. Lastly, I want to look at transformation just for a moment. 
application of God's word is not just for God's glory, it's also for our benefit. Uh, when our lives get out of whack, God uses his words to transform us. In verse 11, it says, the words of the wise are like goats, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails. You know, in this culture, we're not familiar with goats. They were pointed sticks that a shepherd would carry to prod the sheep or the cattle along to keep them from getting into trouble, from getting into danger. The coat was painful. Sometimes we learn through pain, don't we? Sometimes pain is a good thing. You get up off the couch and all of a sudden you have a pain. Maybe next time you're going to get up it differently. Maybe you're going to sit somewhere else. Pain is very important to us. It lets us know when something is wrong. But pain has a way of getting our attention. The poke of the goad was painful, but it was necessary for the safety of the flock. When we get comfortable with our lives, God very often uses his word as a goad to pry us. To keep us away from danger. To get us out of our comfort zone so that we will keep his commandments. Paul describes this purpose once again in Romans chapter 8 verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. This is the goal of the disciple-making process to transform lives to become more like Jesus. That is why we as a church exist today. That is why Jesus has left his followers here on earth for the time being so that we can make disciples. Let me say this, that when when that time is done, when God has redeemed those who will be redeemed, then God will have his way with this world and Christ will come back. Don't think for one moment that God has forgotten you in 2020. The reason why we are still here is because there are still people who need to be saved out of the things that they are in. There are still people to come to Christ. And it is our mandate to teach and to make disciples. I want to close with a quote from C.S. Lewis. As he comments on the absolute necessity for all of us to be in the work of making disciples. It says this, This is the whole of Christianity. There is nothing else. It is so easy to get muddled about. It is easy to think that the church has a lot of different objectives. Education, building, missions, holding services. The church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ. To make them little Christs. To make them like himself. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, mission sermons, even the Bible itself, are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It is even doubtful, you know, whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. It says in the Bible that the whole universe was made for Christ and that everything is to be gathered in him. The role of the church is to make disciples. 
What a great way to end a book that started off with all of us going, oh man, I don't know if I want to do this. The same questions that the preacher had we have today. And he closes with principles of knowing God. Knowing God. Oh, that we as the church would have that same attitude and mindset with everything that has happened this year. COVID, politics, unrest in my short life. This has been a year like no one that I can remember. I'm sure there have been tough years. But in my lifetime, with everything that has gone on, we still have work to do. Knowing God, loving God, fearing God, keeping His commandments, teaching, not just for information, but teaching them to obey the commandments and let that be generational, let that be the life. Let us be found faithful to do exactly that. Loving Father God, we thank you for your word. Father, the book of Ecclesiastes, a, uh, Lord, uh, uh, for many it has been a difficult book. It has been a long road. Uh, Father, I am thankful for the time that's spent here in Ecclesiastes. Because, Father, at the end of the day, it shows us, Lord, that we are no different than what the preacher was when he wrote this book. The preacher had questions, you supplied the answers. We have questions. You have given us the answers in your very word. And Father, we thank you that you have called us to rise above the culture that we find ourselves in. And to not only be disciples, but Father, to be teachers of your word.